Well, welcome everybody uh, to this LTAD chat live on Zoom. I'm Joe Eisman and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, for those who are returning to the LTAD chat live on Zoom, uh, thanks for joining us again. For newcomers, uh, welcome to you. And just a reminder that this is being recorded. Uh, so please mute yourself um, unless you're asking a question. Um, and also mind your manners on the camera unless you choose to stop the video, which that's totally fine as well. Uh, this is an interactive forum. Uh, so please use the chat box for questions and also interactions amongst yourselves um, and with uh, everybody on the call today as well. Um, also remember that the comments in the chat box are being saved. So uh, just in general, just mind you know, Zoom etiquette here as we go through the next hour. So today I'm happy to be here uh, with this panel uh, for what's gonna be a really educational and insightful discussion um, of training load and <clears throat> young athletes. Uh, we have some great scholars uh, who also have a lot of practical experience in applied sports science, uh, working with youth and adolescent athletes. Um, so for our panel, we have Ben Jones, professor at Leeds Beckett University, uh, ben oversees a very productive research group in which they embed researchers and students into clubs. Uh, ben has given talks on training load across the world and happy to have him with us today. Uh, David Johnson is a sports sci scientist with uh, AFC Bournemouth Football uh, Academy in the Premier League. Um, David is also pursuing his PhD at Bath University, focusing on training load growth and injury during the adolescent growth spurt. Similarly, Jay Salter, uh, pursuing PhD uh, related to maturity and training response. Jay just had a paper accepted on monitoring practice, practices of uh, soccer academies related to training load and maturity status. And Andy Bruce um, is also with us today. Andy is a strength and conditioning coach who has just launched a new app, uh, which measures and estimates uh, training load in, in youth athletes. So, Welcome to the panel. Thanks for joining us on LTAD Chat. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for the invite. Sure. So let, let's get started. Let's, let's just start really simple here. Um, let's define training load. And, and again, as we go through the next hour, let's, let's pretend that we're at the pub and just having a conversation amongst the four of you. So let's just start with defining training load. Okay. Shall I go first? Go on in, Ben. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start. Thanks, Joe, and, and thank you for the invite as well. I'll probably start with the most simple explanation I can, and it's probably a um, training load is, is a way of quantifying simply what an athlete does. Um, and we, we can almost think of the complexity and, and the depth of that, that athletes do various different things and the various different things they do. Um, cause various different responses but in effect it's it's simply um monitoring what an athlete does and i suppose for me the the way i try and think about where this fits in everything is everything we we do should be trying to move subjective to objective and training loads is a really nice example of um what has an athlete done so we can actually at whatever point in time go back and see whether it was too much, too little, perfect, and we can con continue improving our practice. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a, a really nice way of summing it up. I think um, sort of when you're looking at training load, you're looking at sort of a, a dose of ma mainly people see as physical activity um, in terms of your sports performance and preparation. And then also this can be sort of thought as part of a sort of broader thing that Ben mentioned there, which is sort of that overall load, and especially in youth athletes, you've got so many aspects as well that contribute to sort of load in general. So whether that's psychology, psychological load and various other elements around just what else is included in training. Yeah, I think, I think you, you both nailed it there saying that the dose response, I think that's my view of it is, we all do exercise in whatever form, whatever age we are, whatever sport we play, but the, the exercise that we do, it doesn't mean we all respond in the same way to it. And I think young athletes are, are 
obviously at the, at the end of one spectrum in their extremities in the way in they de- which they develop. So the dose response quantifying that is, is super important in those young athletes. So, yeah, Andy, before you jump in at the end here, you know, one thing that we always hear with training load is, you know, internal and external. So maybe we can start going down that road a little bit as well and how you all think, and we can start with Andy because we've had some nice, you know, definitions of training load. But what about when, when we hear people talk about internal load and external load? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, it, speaking from my sort of perspective, working in a school, it's, it's an independent sort of private school, um, really privileged kids. They, like we've got some, some cool tool to measure things like external training load. So understanding, for example, how much work has actually been done in an objective manner. Um, and we, we've got like you know, GPS units and things to, to measure distance and stuff, for, you know, whatever you want, you can get a lot of data out of that sort of thing. Um, and then the internal stuff, it's the actual sort of response that, that I had to that individual. Um, just going back to sort of Ben's point, you know, it's, it, it's, it can sound more complicated than it needs to be. I mean, the first point of call, I think, in, certainly in the school setting, most youth settings, is just trying to actually understand what is being done, um, you know, Kids at our school can go between club here. They might be doing S&C in the morning. Then they're running around at break time. They have a PE lesson. They've got a game session. And then they might go off to their academies if they're a talented athlete later in the afternoon. Um, and it's just trying to get a grasp on that, that overall ecosystem. Um, you know, when we think about why we might want to measure all, this, all these loads and, and what we're going to do with it, it's exactly what, what Ben suggests. Like, uh, was it enough? Was it too much? Was it the right thing? You just want to get a touch point with that athlete and say, how are you today? <laughs> how, how do you feel? What, what can you do? And that, there's, that's, that's more what, what we see and what I see sort of training load being used for as a conversation starter more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, good. Anything else there, guys, before we move on in terms of just getting a, a definition of training load out? I think I think for me, Joe, I, I tend to use the a five k run as a good definition um, for most people because we all we all pretty familiar. A lot of us are doing five k runs more than we ever have done at the minute. But a five k run, we all do the exact same external load, if you like. Everyone covers five kilometers, but but the way in which we respond to that internally, your heart rate, your the way your RPE, the way you feel after it, how long it takes you to recover, varies massively. So. The, the, what, the external load, the what that your work that you've done is the same, but the internal response is completely different. And that's, that's, I guess, what we're trying to quantify is how much damage have we done to that athlete from that load. Yeah, yeah. Jay, that's, that, that, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to yeah, probably go along the same lines as you, Joe. I think that's a really good way of explaining it in the sense of your sort of external load is the dose and your response is your internal, could be perceived as your internal load and how you respond to that stimulus quite simply um yeah 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 i was going to segue into assessment i think that's a perfect way to get into some of the assessment obviously you you all have already mentioned some of the tools that are being used but let's let's take a little bit deeper dive so um people on the call and people who listen to this in the future have a real good understanding of how how can we assess training load and let's you know kind of talk about you know internal and external the tools that can be used and then, you know, maybe advantages and disadvantages of each as well. I'll, I'll start if that's okay, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think probably building on, on, on what I started with, I think the, the most important thing when you're, when you're establishing athletes training load for me is you start with the breadth. And the error that we see in practice is this fantastic depth going on. And I'll give an example of um, we look at an athlete's training load during a field-based session where we use GPS that samples at 10 hertz and accelerometer that samples at 100 hertz and we collect all these variables and we track that, yet we do no load monitoring in the gym. And actually, physiologically, it probably counts for 80% more. And, or or in, in rugby world, which is, um, which is obviously my world, you do fantastic locomotor running demand quantification and you forget that they run into each other really hard. Um, and actually, that's the most important thing. So from, from a, when you talk about what do you measure for load, the, the first thing is, are you actually capturing everything that actually goes under that bracket of load? And that includes, you know, if you can start with the duration, the frequency, 
said, are you doing that for all the different training modalities, which are field-based resistance training for, for those youth athletes that are in, in sports in, and, and the people who are within those school environments? Are we quantifying everything the athlete does away from us? Because like an athlete isn't, they, they don't switch on and off their physiology depending on which coach they, they're with. They, everything interacts with each other. And I think probably the first thing is trying to understand um, what we're trying to capture before we get into the, the, the detail of specifically how we do that. And from the most broadest concept, like we, we definitely need something on internal and external load. External load being what the athlete's done, internal load being how are they responding to that. And then we also need something that helps understand um, a volume and intensity. So probably for, for me, probably the most simple example of that is um, session RPE, which is an internal load measure, which is a construct of intensity, which is the RPE multiplied by the volume, which is the duration. So off one thing, you get an internal load measure, which you can unpick a little bit to start understand some of those interactions. Um, and I think for me, that's probably where, where I feel at the moment in terms of make sure we're, we're looking at everything before we worry about the depth too much. Yeah, great, great response, yeah. Ben. Um, I'm, I'm going to piggyback off that because at the end there you said the session RPE and you began to explain it. So I'm going to ask one of the other three panelists maybe to talk a little bit about session RPE and specifically this one question that we always get, like can we trust, can we trust the kids in terms of filling out you know, their RPE. And Ben, I know that you've done some work with your group on reliability of that, but from the other three panelists, just practical experience in using session RPE. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for this uh, to start us off on this, Joe. I think, I think Ben covered it quite nicely there in terms of, you know, what we're looking for here is to, is to get the best reflection we can of, of the way in which that athlete has managed or, or recovered from that session i guess and, and rpe covers everything in the gestalt measure so if they've done a, a, a two-hour training session where maybe half an hour 40 minutes has been in the gym and then they've gone out and done a field-based session rpe can cover both there are ways in which you can differentiate that but but just the general rpe gives you an idea of, of that volume and intensity of that session and how they've perceived it and that can fluctuate hugely between people that you think have done the same session or you prescribe the same session i think with your point there regards to can we trust it i think the answer is is yes and no depending on on the environment that you work in i think if you if you build a relationship and you educate the people that you work with and as to why you're doing this and this goes for children as well as adults um you know and they understand that it's actually to protect them and to make sure they get in exactly what they need and it's not used for selection purposes it's not used to kind of you know, take them out of training if or matches if they're tired or fatigued. I think that can be really valuable. But if it's if it's misused and the players don't understand why you're asking these questions, then I think they can give you some 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 dodgy responses back to make sure they're in the team at the weekend. But also, you know, do they understand what ten out of ten is? Have they been through a training session which really is is a tough session at 12, 13 years old? So I think there's there is part of a learning curve with that as they as they develop as well. Yeah, D David, David, how? Going off that last point, how do you how do you teach uh, the youngsters in the academy to to score RPE? What's your process? Um, it, like Jay said, it's it's a massive sort of the main challenge with that sort of mode of measurement, of, especially in terms of training load, and it's a sort of a constant and ongoing process, especially with your younger players. So obviously, the younger you, the players get, the more difficult it is to explain certain concepts to them, but also the sort of social aspects of trying to give an answer that they think I'm going to think is correct is probably one of the biggest issues. And then social aspects of potentially overhearing another player saying what score they're recording or what the, if the coach at the start of the session said, today we're going to have a hard session, do they need to say, okay, it was hard when, when I come to them with a sheet? Or that so many different aspects in terms of that. So our sort of ongoing education with the players is just – continual, honest conversations between the sports science department, the coaches, the players about why we're collecting our views, what the benefit are, why it's important that they're honest about their answers, and then trying to maintain the highest level of quality in terms of 
making it individualized so they're, they're separated in terms of when they're recording the score using the proper measurement tools and so on Andy anything to add there yeah I just uh, it's really important to, to know what you're actually measuring when you're asking for such an RP when you're trying to answer the question is, is it valid you know it's, it's a really useful exercise for coaches as well if you say well, how hard do you think that session was out of 10 for the, the kids you just set um, I'd, I'd be surprised if many of the coaches I've, <laughs> I've worked with over time would get an accurate estimation of the both the range of, of, of responses they get from the kids um, and whether they, they'd have it right um, it, it can be really really tricky I mean obviously within that as, as, um, as Jamie was saying it's like this this gestalt measure like we're measuring lots of things we're also measuring like their fatigue in there a little bit as well if they've come from a you know, a massive session before they were going to, they're going to say it was harder for them um, than they would have done if they had, you know, had 12 hours sleep and woken up ready to go. So it's just, just taking it with a pinch of salt, I think is, is probably the thing I'd add to that. Yeah. Ben, do you want to speak to uh, the research study that you guys did on this in terms of the reliability and then the concordance between coach and player? And then of course there's the research, right? Which is going to give us the average values, but how do we handle individual differences as well? Yeah, thanks, Joe. So, um, our work, we, um, uh, two of the research from our group, um, Paddy Fibs and, and Sean Scanterby, they did, they did some work looking at the stability of session RPE in periods um, away from the session. Um, almost the, the background to that and why we did with that was um, from a school sport perspective and a rugby union perspective as a practitioner who's responsible for those players, you don't see them at every session. And if you're only ca capturing a small portion of the picture, then actually it's almost, you, you can't do anything with it. Um, and the, uh, the session RP was reliable, was valid um, up to 72 hours after. So it means that actually you can track the play, so you can actually remotely um, monitor the player. Um, in terms of how we looked at it for coach versus athlete, um, we were really interested probably to look at actually more from a coaching perspective, how it influenced their planning. And we got the coaches to plan an easy, moderate, hard session. One of the things that we found when we looked at it against the, against the athletes was that typically um, the moderate session was about the same. Um, when the coach planned a hard session, the athletes underreported compared to the coach. And when the coach has planned an easy session, the athletes overreported. So almost this, um, these athletes almost self-regulated to their own set point. And I, and I sometimes wonder when we talk about training load as a, a way of determining what the athlete's done and some of the questions that are coming in, which are really good, it's almost, it almost goes more uh, around how it fits in the whole process and the whole cycle in terms of, well, um, do, how do we know whether an athlete's done enough? Well, what were you trying to achieve? Because actually, if you knew what you were trying to achieve and you achieved that, then the answer is yes. If you didn't achieve that, then the answer is either, you know, you've done too much or not enough. And, and it probably goes back to that whole subjective and objective um, analogy I used at the start in terms of um, it, training load 100% has to be fitting against the coaching model given the coaches, and that's the reason why we did the coach versus athlete RPE, because is the coach in our world is the one that determines the load. You know, they determine when they keep going. They determine when, um, when a session's cut. They determine whether it's hard or easy. As much as we as sports scientists like to think we're influenced, we don't really. Um, but actually, that's probably, that's for me where we wanted to develop our understanding there. I just wanted to add something onto that from sort of an anecdotal point of view from within the club we have a sort of weekly periodization that looks to make easy moderate and hard sessions throughout the week and what we often find is that most of the sessions are relatively similar throughout the week especially from an RPE point of view um, so we've spent a lot of time trying to help our coaches develop harder sessions and also develop lighter sessions to obviously change that periodization and allow that sort of dough applying an appropriate training dose on certain days and then allowing enough recovery on other days and Ben I just had a quick question for you about that study what I've read the study but I just wanted you to remind me of what age range were the players and do you think and sort of a second question on that was do you think that having a session in between 
in that 72 hour window would affect the RPE from the session proceeding. For example, if you ask, ask them on a Wednesday what Monday session was, even though you've already trained on Tuesday. Um, I pro um, the, so the one that, that Paddy Fibs did was uh, under 18 rugby union. The one that Sean Scantlebury did was, uh, was school based uh, scholarship athletes. Okay. Um, so almost the, like sixth form age. Um, if I'm honest, I can't remember the, the detail, which I should, but I can't, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's because you published too many papers. <laughs> it's, it's like, because I've picked studies. I think um, on, on Dave's point there regarding that, one of the things that can help in terms of uh, quantify, because what we see there is like regression to the mean is people give like seven out of 10, almost kind of whatever the session was. It's like, oh, it was hard. Yeah, it was hard, but it wasn't that hard. I'll give seven because he's probably going to give seven as well. So I think one of the things that we can, we can do there is, is have consistency in the, in the measure that we use. So the scale that you use. Um, see lots of these variations of the RP scales going around like color coded you've got the omni scales where you get emojis and things and they might work with, with with children but I think if we're using this as a as a serious tool to monitor load and, and try and prevent injury and improve performance I think using the validated ones that are out there you've got the CR10 the, the CR100 scales and having consistency and using those verbal anchors effectively so you know, the scale should be used alongside the verbal anchors so the players can see, you know, whether it's moderately hard, very hard, intense, and, and they build up a, a, a kind of familiarity with that over time. And that means that rather than just giving a number out of 10, they're actually using those verbal anchors to inform their judgment. And hopefully over time, that becomes more sensitive to actual variances in training load. So I think yeah, that's guys, key. Yeah, guys, I want to move forward a little bit here and, and on the back end of this conversation, definitely want to get into training load, um, monitoring and management. There's a lot of good questions related to that. But before we move ahead, we've spent some nice time talking about session RPE, which is a very simple measure to implement. Um, sometimes easier said than done, right? But still paper, pencil. Um, yeah. So what, what, let's talk about, you know, more of the objective approaches with some of the technology that we have, specifically GPS and heart rate monitoring. And let's just maybe take, you know, five minutes or so just to kind of give some, some key nuggets about uh, GPS and heart rate monitoring, um, more specific to, you know, implementation and perhaps some reliability validity issues that people really need to be aware of if they're going to go uh, toward that space. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go for this. I, I, I think um, there's obviously a lot of a lot of research that's using GPS, particularly in adult sports, Joe. There's, there's loads out there, with, you know, across various different sports using GPS to monitor training load because, you know, just by adding a, a it's a simple unit, but it's very technical in terms of what it provides. There's a whole whole host of metrics that you can get from that. You know, as Ben said before, the volume, the intensity, the, you know, you get the fast, the slow distance covered. You get pretty much any number you want from that. But the, the problem we've got, if this is a, a youth chat, is that, that that's quite expensive kit. And, and often when we're working with children, in, even in some of the top level academies in this country and, and obviously grassroots, they just don't have access to it. So I think, although, I mean, Ben and David will be much better placed to talk about the, the way in which they use that data with their players, I'm sure. But, but in terms of using it, it's, it's not that commonly applied within like younger than 16 I would I would say some clubs do but very few do so that's why maybe our default is RPE um, because we don't have access to that on mass I don't know if David you want to talk about what you do at Bournemouth you using it because I know you do uh, some age groups uh, yeah so we generally monitor our under 15 16 age groups up in terms of GPS and then we've dabbled a little bit at 13s 14s more to get an idea of are hard and easy sessions and give some objective numbers back to the coaches to sort of quantify that. Um, obviously, it takes more time, effort to download the data and analyze GPS data. So it's that sort of when that sort of high performance element comes in that Jay was talking about where you need more facilities and resources to have a good GPS monitoring system. Um, in terms of sort of youth athletes i see the sort of the real benefit is to understand firstly where how your individuals compare to each other 
but also comparing that then to your um, subjective data of how hard they think a certain session of a certain level was. And if they all cover relatively similar distances, who's actually struggling and who's striving in that environment or in, from a subjective point of view. Yeah. Yeah, just very quickly, my, my experience as sort of alluded to before with, with GPS was, you know, I'm the sole SNC coach at a school of like 900 boys. Um, the first 15 rugby were using it. You know, we had seven units. He's like, go on, can you, can you give me some, <laughs> you give me some data, please? You know, it's a minefield of trying to get into it. It's really, it takes a lot of time. Um, and I think it's, as Jamie suggested, it's, it's, there, there are places where it's appropriate um, and you can use it if you have the time um, and the, the buy-in from everybody involved. Um, but again, you know, lots of these, um, the packages that come with it, they're, they're giving you composite measures. So you're measuring two things twice. And if you want to combine that with something else, you've got to make sure you're not, you're not double accounting for, for, for training load stats, essentially. Um, it can be really tricky. I've, I've stepped away from it and passed the GPS units over to somebody else <laughs> since, because um, so, they can be pretty tricky to, you know, always losing them, all sorts of stuff going on as well. It's, it's, they can be a real time drain, but of course they can still give you valuable information if you know what you're looking for. Yeah, I think it comes back to what Ben was saying earlier about that sort of breadth and depth sort of idea is if you are if you want a monitoring system that's going to capture everything, GPS might not be that answer, but for luckily enough, we're in a situation at Bournemouth where we, we got the ability to go into more depth and look at specific objective numbers from the GPS units and then devise training programs, create targets and allow us to sort of match that to our um, club philosophy and our sort of progression plan through the age groups, which is a really lucky and ideal situation. But obviously you've got pros and cons to any measure and you need to consider sort of your environment primarily. Yeah, Let, let's get some of these questions related to um, load management, load monitoring. So. Um, what are your top tips for load monitoring from a practical perspective for an amateur coach or a school coach? Um, first for me would be the context. Think about what, what you can manage and what's going to be realistic to be ongoing. The, the main benefit to the training load I see is sort of longitudinal monitoring so you need to find something that you can establish over an extended period of time yeah i think d just to, to build on that i think it's if you're a grassroots or like a, a school level coach i think you can i mean ben, ben will be able to talk about some of paddy's work like organized chaos you, you can only manage part of the pie at that level um you know it can do in, in academy level but definitely a grassroots you know if you're manipulating your training session to within an inch and you know you've got them doing that but then they have to get on their bike and cycle home for half an hour or, or they've done a, something at school or whatever else. I think you can only control so much. So I think it's been really clear about really simple. Do you want it to be a hard session? You know, if it's some kind of like periodized plan and you're working towards an event or a competition, it, do you want that to be a hard session? Well, you know, plan for that and then allow them time to recover. Do you want it to be an easy session or do you want there to be a focus on, on one or the other? I think if you've got the, the minute, like not full-time environment at that age but a more controlled environment like an academy system then using objective data and, and monitoring that over time regularly and planning your sessions strictly is, is really important but i think if you're if you're a grassroots coach who sees these once or twice a week controlling your sessions isn't is going to be a tiny portion of what they really do so i wouldn't worry about it too much from my perspective any other top tips well, I'd, you know, you've got to think about why we're, we're using training load monitoring in the first place. And, you know, that information, data is completely pointless if you collect it and it sits on the computer and no one looks at it and you don't talk to anyone about it. It's got to inform practice in some way. So, you know, again, what's the context? Do you have time? The resources is one of the huge barriers of able to actually implementing training monitoring. If you can implement something simple, like let's say session RPE and get a decent, decent consistency and use it to educate your players, um, you know, how is it? As Ben suggested, a really, really good point. You know, how does it relate to the coaching model? How are you actually getting it to make a, a change that's going to be of some perceived benefit and then be able to evaluate that at the end? So do what you can do within your context and do, but make sure you're doing it for a reason, not just doing it so you can say you're doing training load monitoring. Uh, yeah, just to build on that, I think that's, 
that's really good. And for me, you probably start with just the overall purpose. And that, that's the, the top tip in terms of what you're trying to do. And then what do you need to go underneath that to then um, evaluate if you achieved what you were trying to do? You know, so if, if, you're, if you're trying to um, expose athletes to hard sessions because it's pre-season, you feel that's the right thing to do and your professional judgment is, is determining that, then fitness testing with training load measures in the middle actually allow you to see whether you did get the athletes fitter and actually if you didn't then you can go back and understand why and and I think that you know training load without any measures both either um, the response being the acute or for me probably the more important one would probably be the the more medium long-term responses because they allow you to have really rich conversations with um, all the stakeholders that get that are involved in the athlete, both um, the athlete who's probably the most, well, they are the most important, the coach, the SNC coach, all the other coaches. And that's why I think that we, we you know, training load is, is a small part of a big thing. And, and you can never know what an athlete should do unless you know what are you trying to do, the reasons why. And I think that um, we probably shouldn't, we probably shouldn't, claim that um sports scientists kind of came up with this because coaches were probably doing it anyway they just weren't calling it training load um and i think that that's sometimes really important to to understand as well that actually training load is just a really good way when done well of evaluating what athletes are doing yeah good good points there ben um a few questions in the queue over here about uh, peak height velocity and what strategies need to be put into place during the adolescent growth spurt. Um, David, I think I'm going to direct this one to you since you're spending a lot of time in this space uh, right now. Yeah, yeah def definitely. Um, I, I think that's uh, a really difficult question that we probably don't have all the answers to yet at the moment. Um, I know Jay's doing some good work in this area as well. Um, I I think the main thing that it would link back to what we were defining training load at the start and thinking about those dose response relationships. If you think that there's an increased vulnerability towards injury that's associated with peak high velocity, that means that the same dose of training that was being applied before or after would then put them at a higher risk. So that could then change your planning in terms of, do we need to then adapt the dose to get a different response um, do we need to allow them more recovery time if they're potentially more at risk of overuse injuries within that period um, and sort of it links back to sort of the monitoring aspect I think if you really want to understand that area you need to be monitoring growth and maturation to a, a consistent basis on a longitudinal method and then also consistently monitoring training load and that for um, sort of wider sports coaches is it going to be a very difficult task seeing as that's my sole role essentially within a football club and I spend all my time looking at specifically that aspect in relation to my PhD. Um, but having said that, we can obviously take slightly easier versions where we've been discussing you coaches understanding how to make an easy uh, moderate or hard sessions you could then just think about are, are we looking for sort of those um, subjective signs of growth and maturation are we looking for coordination issues that might be occurring during peak height velocity if you suspecting that a player is at in increased risk or they seem to be breaking down with that dose response the um, that sort of dose of training that you're providing then it might be time to change what you're doing and sort of think about providing longer recovery periods and or maybe adapting train to be lighter during that phase for specific players yeah I think, uh, go ahead the, the, yeah just to, to to build on that david made some really good points there. i think obviously we, we will be generally aware that within an age group, a chronological age group, particularly under 13s, 14s, 15s, you could have, although they may only be a year apart in age at the most, they, they could be three or four years biologically different. So you put them onto to the field or in the gym and, and ask them to do a training session. And if you're not considering the, 
the individual differences there. I think we're setting them up to fail because, you know, I've, I've seen some pictures on Twitter about there was a guy in Ajax who was about six foot three and then he was playing against another guy from another team who was at like just over four foot and they were at the same age group. And from a mechanical perspective, they're not getting the same out of it. And particularly some of the work that I've started to, to, to do recently is it's that biomechanical load, you know, the, the ability of the the body to control its own weight in terms of, you know, that weight ratio is, is poor between, between those age groups, particularly for the less developed. So if we ask them to do the same thing, we're going to get a different response, which we might get away with for a session or two or a couple of weeks. But if we do that repeatedly without, without you know, influencing the, the way we prescribe our loads, we're going we're gonna to end up, you know, with injuries. And that's why I think we see um, huge injury increases around 13s, 14s, under 15s. A lot of them are, are non-contact um, base, which you know generally are deemed to be preventable within sport. Not all of them, but we can we can do something about preventing those injuries. And I think we tend to take a reactive approach. So we wait until there's an injury and then we manipulate their load. Whereas I think what we need to start doing as practitioners is is identifying, as David said, you know, through maturity assessments regularly, when is the load likely to need to be influenced because they're coming up to a high risk period. So rather than waiting for it to happen and then changing it can we advance, you know, do, think ahead and actually start to maybe reduce some of that mechanical load ahead of um, that, that time period. Yeah, I want to move on to uh, a couple of questions. Um, one is individualized speed thresholds, obviously using GPS. And then uh, one of the participants opened up a can of worms here. That's probably going to take us a while. And that's looking at acute to chronic. Uh, workload ratio. So let's start with individualized speed thresholds. So when you're using GPS, uh, what are your thoughts on individualizing the speed threshold um, in young athletes and especially considering, you know, maturation and how, you know, that speed zone can be changing um, on a continuous basis? Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting point with the speed zone thresholds and especially seeing that growth and maturation are dramatically going to affect how fast you can run, but also how much um, sort of physical output you can sustain in a training session or a match. Um, from my perspective, um, you, you need to think of it both as an individualized perspective of getting um, those thresholds for each individual, but actually the, the sort of um, absolute values are also important because that's where a match is potentially won or lost. It doesn't matter if you can run 100% of your speed, but your speed is still slow compared to the other players. So at the end of the day, when we're trying to look at performance and developing players in the in academy setting for an elite level, you need to be also thinking along the absolute terms. Anybody else want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, jump in. I think that it, it make, conceptually it makes loads of sense um, to individualise the speed threshold. I think that where, where the complication comes is we don't know what we're individualising it to. Um, because you, you talk about a speed threshold, you can do, obviously look at a speed threshold or you could look at um, a physiological measure, so uh, maximum aerobic speed or, or some other variable. Because... Are you interested in, in the mechanical load or the, the physiological um, metabolic load? I think that um, it, it makes no sense to, to assess youth athletes or female athletes against senior male derived speed thresholds conceptually that you know it, it doesn't make sense whatsoever. Um, so I think that and, and there is starting to be emerging work in this uh, in this space. But I think that probably the most important thing that we've got to get to within within practice as well is probably being consistent with our practices so that we can monitor and evaluate. And I suppose what we, whatever, and probably as well accepting that things aren't going to be perfect because leading nicely into what the next thing's going to be about, you can imagine that individualized speed thresholds is going to be some, some it's going to be um, applied, critiqued, retracted it, because it's it doesn't, it doesn't measure everything we think it can. So uh, probably, yes, it, it needs to be in terms of what exactly those will be. Um, I'm not sure without somebody's practice becoming almost very jumpy 
Yeah, so do we want to jump into this next topic, this can of worms about acute to chronic workload ratio? Maybe first of all, again, for people who might be on the call, just kind of getting into this space of training load, let's let's define and uh, kind of set like, how do we determine acute to chronic workload ratio? And then let's open up the can of worms because there's been a bit of debate on this topic uh, from a few different groups. Uh, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so, so I think it's it's probably between five and ten years now. We've been we've been plagued, as I guess, with research on training load around this acute chronic workload ratio that uh, was kind of came out of Tim Gabbett's work, um, and that's that's kind of proliferated the research in training load and and was kind of the go to metric for for a few years until you know the methodological. Uh, critiques came out of, of how it was derived and you know the, the 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 math behind it basically and I think I think what it's done although there are there is a lot of critique about the acute chronic road ratio is it's put this dose response back on people's radar I think it, as Ben alluded to earlier it, it's been around for for a while and it's not something that we've only just started doing but I think it's it's become vogue again because the acute workload as in most of the case most of the time it's seven the last seven days workload versus the chronic which is generally although this does change the last 28 days. So it's how, how fit or how much work have you done to be prepared for what you're about to do? So have you got work in the, you know, work in the bank, I guess, to, to be able to handle what you're about to do? And that ratio should be somewhere between 0.8 and 1.3, according to the research. But there has been several critiques about the way in which that number, that ratio is derived. And there's, there's things like exponentially weighted and, and people have used all the different metrics. But but again, some of the questions around that, and Ben will will follow this up, I'm sure, is, is what metric do you use? You know, do, do you use absolute speeds or do you use total distance covered? It, it completely depends on what you're trying to achieve. And you could have between 10 and 15 different acute chronic workload ratios. All of them could be inaccurate. So there's so much, you know, so much work to do in that area. Do you want me to have a go? Yeah, on, ben, yeah. go um, again. <laughs> So I, I think if we start, so, so um, Jay really nicely summarised what acute chronic workload ratios are. I think to take a step back, and and it's and this is a fantastic, almost slightly philosophical um, thing, because if everyone remembers that the pur purpose of science is to disprove theory, the purpose of science isn't to prove theories; it's to disprove theories. And, and that's how we progress. We progress by knowing something doesn't work and then the challenge is to make it better. Um, for the UK people on, on the call, it's almost like acute chronic workload ratios were like the Joe Wicks for PE. Um, everybody knew what, what they were trying to do and, and nobody was doing it until something comes out that kind of makes a bit of sense and everyone does it. Um, and then everybody can then say, say why, why it doesn't work. It, Probably two examples of where, for me, um, so where we, we have used it to a certain extent um, and we wouldn't now, but it, but it actually proved useful. Um, and we've cited already some of uh, Paddy Phibbs's work. And we did that in a way of um, basically showing coaches what players were doing on a, on a weekly, monthly basis. Because if we're really honest, coaches didn't believe us because they didn't see the players that much because these are players that sat in multiple programs. So part of the critique around the acute chronic workload um, ratio that Franco and Pelizzeri uses practically is it's quite obvious that if you double the workload an athlete does, they're going to get injured. That's no surprise. And he often follows that up with, um, you shouldn't be doubling a workload of an athlete because it's pretty dumb which, um, which is 100% is accurate and is right. But it does happen when you have an athlete sat in the middle of three different training programs. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, it, it, is, it is a challenge and it does, almost this mismanagement of load does happen. So we, we have um, published using it almost just to highlight that actually these loads were really random as well. Um, I think going going forward you know the the it was never it was probably the acute chronic workload ratio one mathematically um as jay said um had a lot of flaws in it and i think as training load monitoring progressed it was never going to stick because it is in effect a univariate approach which picks one thing and tracks it over time and 
the more we understand about load, the more we the more we see that we've got to measure far more things. And it's kind of as I started, um, as I said at the start, the most important thing on training load is trying to measure everything. Where a lot of the acute chronic workload studies that we see and that are published, they will focus on field based exposure, and they will literally disregard gym ba- gym based training sessions, which again conceptually may don't make don't make sense of course they must contribute to an injury risk in somehow because they contribute to the overall load so um my my view of the acute chronic workload ratio is and the debate is that it's been an absolutely fantastic um example of how science should work that it's something got applied pretty quick and dirty and it, it allowed people to be more aware and exposed to it. And then as researchers, our job is to make is to critique and evaluate things to make sure scientifically they are robust and they they do hold validity. And actually through the work that's gone on, it's shown actually now it probably doesn't. And now the next step then is, okay, well, what should people do instead, apart from going back to what it was before, which was um which, which which was probably not as well defined because people probably weren't people probably didn't measure workload well enough before because they didn't know what to do with it the ratio gave a really nice way of people having a number to evaluate whether enough was enough or whether it was too much etc and i think with everybody's mentioned it so far around um around the response and actually if the next step is understanding the response better to the load whether that's the acute or the longer term then, then that's probably the best way in terms of progressing the field. Yeah, can I just jump in on the end of that as well quickly? I mean, we can, you know, one of the things we've tried to put together as Deterra is again, my background and Stephen, the guy who's the developer for it, his, his background is in math, so he handles that sort of stuff, um, is, you know, in triathlon and, and long distance, you know, aerobic sports where you can measure training stress balance pretty, pretty reasonably because, you know, your cyclist is just on a bicycle. And if you know you've got a decent measure, like a power meter, measuring exactly how much work they've done on a given session, you know, you can get a reasonably predictable model. But all the cyclists I work with, you know, they get obsessed with the numbers. I think it just ties into the broader picture of it's really easy to get sucked in by a figure like acute to chronic workload ratio and thinking this is going to tell me what's going to happen on a given point in time. Um, it, it's, you know, it's probably not going to, that's not the way to really think about and look at these sorts of things. It, it might be a piece of the puzzle, depends on the ability or the, you know, how good your data is. You know, there's no point using an acute to quantum load ratio if you've not got an accurate representation of probably the last three months of training. The model just won't even give you any, any sensible number that you can even use. Um, and I think perhaps just by, you know, using it as an educational tool and understanding, like, broadening people's understanding through acute to chronic workload ratio it's you know how much has that person done relative to what they're used to doing okay and you can map perhaps use it to map out a season if you put all these fixtures in and you reckon they're going to be this difficult and this is what your kids are used to doing that's a pretty stupid plan or that's a sensible plan or that's you know that's about as far as i think you can probably use these sorts of things um yeah it could be easy to be drawn into the idea that's going to give you some sort of magic answer or tell you when someone's going to be injured um, yeah. but I'm not sure it does that. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, David. I think Ben and all three speakers have summed it up really well and spoken about the sort of the negative side, well, potentially negative sides and some small positives. I think obviously we're thinking sort of about the context and the individualization and the sort of the complexity and that one measure is probably never going to give you all the answers that people thought it might have done. Um, I know that having said that, I think that the acute chronic ratio did consider sort of three potentially important elements of training load, sort of those long durations to understand somebody's fitness and how they progressed and got to where that current stage is. And then sort of that fatigue and understanding that short period and then changes in training um, through the ratio and um, some work that came out from the University of Bath that I think uh, Stephen West, who's actually on this call, was involved in, looked at sort of those principal components and essentially analysed various training load metrics and essentially grouped them into those three things, fitness sort of long-term things, short-term components and then changes. And 
that could potentially be your sort of starting base for okay if we're going to monitor training load we need to look at these three areas and decide which metrics within those areas we, we're going to use yeah so on the on the back end of that conversation how do you know when too much is too much and too little is too little like when you guys are monitoring young athletes what metrics are you using to determine if it's too much if it's too little or just right the golden question that joe <laughs> uh, i i get to ask it you get to answer it <laughs> you want me to have a go or are you gonna go well, yeah, no you go from, you're going i think from from our practical work joe the the example isn't it it may not be perfect but we would use daily um we would use wellness screening and from the whole cycle as if a player's done and these are all proxy measures so um you know if a player's done a resistance training session and they come in the following session and they're, they're not sore while soreness isn't the best indication of how hard an athlete's worked we probably know that actually the athlete could work a little bit harder if they've done a resistance training session and they're really sore on their wellness markers more than we thought, then we know they've, then they know it's been too hard. So it's almost, is the wellness response what we expected? If we go hard, there should be a decrease. And if we go easy, there should be maintenance or an increase. So they're the, they're the, they're the acute ones that we'd use on the fly practically to help support our decision-making. The more longer-term ones would be um, and, you know, this definitely isn't new or, or novel, but it was be around our fitness testing, that if our athletes aren't getting strong enough, aren't improving strength, then we know they're not improving strength. We know there's a reason that's wrong. And that's either they're doing too much outside, they're not doing enough resistance training, or there's a combination of both. So then we go back into that. Equally, um, speed development, if they're, they're not improving speed, et cetera, or fitness. And I think that's how how practically we've used we've how we've used training load to kind of go with um is it is it hard is it too hard is it is it not hard enough and it goes really back to you know what we're trying to achieve in different phases and, and different blocks and like it's been fantastic for us and, and one of the things where that i really value training load for is i think it's brought everybody together in terms of sports science, S and C, medical, nutrition, coaches, because it's it's the fundamental thing that everyone can sit around and talk around. Where you know you look at probably where we were at as a multidisciplinary team, and we weren't multidisciplinary because S and Cs were focusing on gym-based metrics, and coaches were doing coaching stuff, and there was nothing kind of central to pinning all that together. So you know, practically, it's it's. You know, as a, an MDT around an athlete, which, you know, is talking very idealistic in a professional sport world, what we're all trying to do is the athlete gets in there, which is probably about right. And if they're not, then how can we then change that? Yeah, I think just to, to build on Ben's point there, I think with regards to, to metrics, if, if you, based on the, the conversation we've had around the difficulty with accessing GPS and heart rate monitors and, and having the resources and time to be able to interpret that and, and decide on your usable metrics. I think if you've got an environment where you've established trust with your, your players and, and a coaching environment and the players are familiar with uh, session RPUs and they're used you know, consistently and, and um, in the same manner as in like the time in which they're presented, the, the verbal indicators that they're using, I think that could be a good marker, but not as a, a numeric value. I think what we're looking for is, is variation from their normal. So if they come in and they, they're giving you these kind of weekly loads of this value and that shoots up or it drops down, all that does is spark a conversation. And then you have a chat with that individual about, you know, what have you been doing? You know, like, have you been doing extra at school? Have you been feeling any discomfort? You know, there's, there's markers of that to try and get in early rather than wait for them to come to you. And I think it's, it's using that information that these tools are giving us to, to stimulate conversation and, um, and, and broaching it that way rather than relying purely on the numbers because I think that, that can lead us down a, a bad path. Yeah, let's, uh, let's finish up here in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, I have two questions and we're going to kind of go rapid fire uh, down the line. 
One relates to research and the other one relates to practical advice. Okay. So first question is, what do you see as the future of training load monitoring in terms of research? Where, where are we going in the research space in this, in this whole area of training load and training load monitoring? Going. I'll, I'll I'll go with mine. I, I'll I'll fire off mine first. Uh, my my points. I think uh, Dave and, and Ben both alluded to this earlier on. It's 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 finding out what that that dose response is uh, at a maturation level. So, you know, once we once we prescribe a, a dose a load, and and this is internal and external. Like if we can find out what an external load does from an internal perspective. At individuals throughout that maturity cycle and pre post and, and every, everything in between I think then we're, we're some way down to understanding how and the relationship of, of training load on injury or potentially on performance as well at the minute there's very few studies that have, that have looked at objective data um, on the variations of training load uh, on maturity so that that's definitely a, a, an area we need to tap into and I think with uh, objective markers such as GPS and, and such alike becoming more common within teams now at that level. I think we'll see more of that information coming available soon. Yeah, I think as Jay said, there'll be work around sort of looking at those relationships in youth populations to a greater extent, and I think that's really important. Um, the other thing I think is probably going to occur that Ben sort of alluded to a little bit is more work around rather than caring about specific metrics, but how are you applying those tools in, in a system and how are they communicated and what are the effects of that? Um, and then potentially testing systems, which include multiple elements to actually have real world practical benefits. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I can probably see two areas. I think the first one is, um, and it's happening um, is in the professional and higher level, uh, including youth sport, is more multivariate analysis and deal with the complexity of the data and dealing with the time series nature of it. Um, I think that's really important. That leads into, and this is some of Dan Weaving's work, um, around we talk about training load validity and the validity of training load measures. And when we say that, do we mean, is the GPS telling us the right speed? Or do we mean, does that training load measure actually help somebody get better? Because you can spin that validity either way. And if, if the validity is not around, does it do what we think it does? Then actually it's not a, not a great tool anyway. So, and then the other one is that um, it's the, uh, the guys in Australia, um, Alice Sweeten has done some fantastic work on this and we started, is around movement sequencing. Because if you look at the GPS, it's actually what we report now is a very high level um, summary data of it. And actually it does sample um, frequently. So we can look at how many times people turn left, turn right, turn sprint, come back. And I think where, where that to me will be really powerful and it won't be for some time yet, is we start then talking around um, exercise specificity, around return to play. Our athletes actually doing similar movement patterns that they should be doing rather than have they hit the total distance or the high speed meters, because they can do it in so many different ways. I'll leave that one to the researchers. So. <laughs> well, okay, let's start, with, let's start with you then, Andy, about a uh, practical piece. So last question of the session. Uh, thanks to all, all of you uh, for your great insight, both scientifically and practically. Um, but what, let's leave with what advice do you have for a sport coach or those who are just getting into this area? What, 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 what's, what's the starter kit? Um, again, focus uh, absolutely on, on the athlete. It's gotta be, you know, what are you trying to do and what's the, what's the outcome you're looking for? And, you know, certainly within a school setting, I'm just trying to manage what that kid's going through in a really difficult, crazy time in their lives when they're growing really, really fast. And they've got all this other stuff to deal with. It's not just sport in their lives. Um, it's, it's around understanding and improving their well-being as best I can and protecting that in some ways, whether that's, you know, minimizing exposure to crazy training loads or not, or minimizing exposure to not doing nearly enough to, to be fit for your sport, whatever it might be. Um, it's got to be to protect the well-being of that kid. Um, so practically, 
if you can measure that in some way or keep, keep your finger on the pulse on that in some way, um, that's, that's a very good start. Yeah, I think that as, as Andy sort of alluded to there, it's got to be something that's manageable, that's specific for your context. So go back to those questions that Ben mentioned earlier of what, what am I trying to find out and what am I going to do? And then actually applying that and making it, making a difference. There's no point monitoring stuff if you're not going to use it for any reason, whether that's planning your overall training plan or planning your season or making improvements to the season as a whole or whether that's adapting players individual training loads week to week day to day yeah i think just just on catching up on those points there i think the the, the take-home message for me would be find a system that you can consistently perform over time and, that, and when we say consistently I, I mean even the same person doing it you know so you, you're asking the questions in the same way so you're doing a consistent method but then that method needs to be something that you can interpret and feed back to the key stakeholders. So whether it's coaches, whether it's the medical staff, whether it's the players themselves, or whether it's even parents, you need to be able to collect that data consistently, but then actually turn it around and, and, and make sure that that informs practice in some way. So don't start picking you know, really elaborate um, monitoring practices if you can only report partial a portion of that so just make sure that whatever you do you're able to interpret that and give that information to the people that need it regularly yeah i've got very i agree with everything that's being said just start really basic don't overcomplicate it and just be robust in in robust and confident in the measures that you're collecting so that it actually informs your practice so that you can evaluate and you can develop and you can review what you've been doing Good, good stuff, guys. Thanks again for being on this panel. A lot of good comments coming in, uh, covered a lot of ground. I think it's going to be a really valuable resource for people uh, who follow LTAT chat. So um, thanks again. The next chat is going to be next uh, Saturday, May 9th, um, when um, my great friends and colleagues, Tony Moreno and Rick Howard, are going to join me. We're going to discuss um, a no frills grassroots town hall workshop that we've provided to help communities implement best practices in long-term athletic development. We call it the LTAD playground. Um, we also have several other LTAD chats in the queue um, and also happy to hear from you in terms of topics and perhaps uh, guests uh, that we should have on. Um, we're probably going to be taking a break uh, May 16th and then we'll come back on May 23rd. The other thing is LTAD Chat's going to return to its original format on Twitter this week, uh, starting on Monday, where um, uh, the group from Working With Parents and Sports are going to host the chat. We're going to have a little bit different format. We're going to drop one question every day. So at noon Eastern time, 5 p.m. British time, um, they're going to drop a question um, related to dealing with sport parents or working with sport parents. Um, so we can have some dialogue around that topic. That's going to lead us again right, right into next Saturday when we uh, have our next live Zoom session. So again, thanks for the panel and everybody who logged in today. Um, have a great day. And remember, you can't manage what you don't measure. Mm -hmm. yeah, All right. Thanks, Joe. All nice. right, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day, guys. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, cheers. Bye-bye.